Okay, everybody, it's Thursday. First up, I'm going to answer some amazing Ask Jason questions, including why a bootstrap company might or might not take venture capital. It's a great question. Why would you take venture capital if you don't need it? Uh, I also answer the question about There Will Be Blood, the uh, famous film, and uh, why so many entrepreneurs seem to love this film. Then I will have uh, Lon Harris on. He's back to talk about all things streaming. It's going to be an amazing show. Stick with us. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Athletic Greens. Reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. Go to athleticgreens.com slash twist to get a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Ravello. Looking to affordably scale your product development with global tech talent in U.S. time zones? Hire vetted remote developers in Latin America with Ravello. Get 20% off for the first three months at ravello.com slash twist and Babbel. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Save up to 55% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash twist. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash twist. Okay, here's an interesting question. What do you think of founders that have great ideas, but those ideas require a lot of money up front? before it can become profitable many from series a won't be enough okay so deep tech comes to mind you want to build a battery company you want to build a flying uh car this kind of stuff if you're going to go for something where it requires 25 million dollars uh, in r d right it's kind of a bridge too far and you have to do one of two things one you uh have to break the company down into its component parts and maybe build something that takes a little less money and this is very hard to do in your mind you're saying well i'm going to build an electric uh you know like son the book company boom uh that was um you know making sonic jets that comes to mind right <laughs> building an airplane that's gonna be hundreds of millions of dollars and so i think they started with like building a little prototype unit that was smaller and maybe that was going to cost 25 million dollars or something but those things are really hard you have to have a lot of credibility so how do you build credibility so you either go the credibility or you narrow the focus one way to narrow the focus is if you wanted to build a robot, let's say, to do deliveries, right? Well, you could build that little robot that looks like R2-D2 that you see delivering burritos in Berkeley and other places. So there were companies that were going to build hardware like that. And so what they did was they said, you know what, let's just hack it together and get an experiment going and show that this could work. So how did they hack it together? Well, they put phones in them, they had cameras, they had LTE, and a person was driving and they were walking behind it. So if you've never seen this, people simulated a robot delivering a burrito by literally like they were driving a like a, what they call those RC cars, like they were driving a remote control car. They were walking behind it with like a little RC controller and somebody would order a burrito and they would be five feet behind it with a camera on them and a camera on the thing and they would simulate walking it to somebody's house. Okay, great. Now investors go, okay, you did that for a million dollars. You ran a test for six months. People got their burritos. They did come out. They did take the burrito from the thing. You were standing 10 feet behind it. So you didn't have to worry about any regulation. You were just running an RC car down the street. What a brilliant hack to do what's called a proof of concept. So you have to think, can I do a proof of concepts that builds my credibility? Or are you if you know, if, if you are like some legendary person, Rodney Brooks coming out of MIT, you've done robotics for a long time, you know, rich people, you might get a Jeff bezos to give you the money to do it or a uh, kitty hawk right which just shut down i understand they had um you know larry page and sebastian had worked with larry page before so a lot of credibility so either you need a ton of credibility and just really deep pockets that'll take the flyer on you for an important idea or you can do a proof of concept and you got to be very clever about that it's a great question what's your advice for co-founder conflict great question philip where the business is doing well but the general relationship between the founders is breaking down as things get busier okay so there's always going to be founder conflict just like there's always going to be uh conflicts between siblings friends partners married couples whatever uh th this is just the nature of life people don't see eye to eye now when there's a business Here's the good news. It's just one business. There can be many businesses in the world. So if you have three co-founders, let's say, and one of the co-founders disagrees with the other two, well, you got a very easy vote. Two out of three people want to do X. The third person wants to do Y. Okay, now you have to do a negotiate settlement here. That person can keep their equity. That person can get voted out. You want to have a very clean exit where possible. And uh, sometimes that means the person keeps half their shares puts the other ones back, maybe the person has the ability to sell those shares and get some money from them. And your board, your attorneys, uh, and common sense and, and a third party helping you 
typically an attorney or a board member, an investor can help you navigate this. So I, I sometimes get pulled into this and I'll just say, okay, listen, the three of you own 20% each. You're two years into this 20%, 20%, 20%. You're leaving. Okay, so you've earned half of your 20%. You got 10 points of the 20. What do we do about that other 10%? You do you really want to stay and you want to get that right? Okay, we'll make you a special advisor and you can earn 2% of it. So you're at 12 out of 20. And if not, you're going to get fired anyway. And you, you're not going to get that 2%. So we'll give you that 2% we will make you feel good. You get listed as a co founder on the website for all time. Uh, and maybe the VC says, Oh, yeah, now you know, you have another idea, I'll, I'll, I'll seed invest in your other idea, I'll give you 500k. So there you go. You know, there, there's a lot of different negotiated settlements that occur. And if you look at Snapchat that wound up in a lawsuit, who knows the truth there. If you look at YouTube, there was a third partner, he wanted to leave, he got, you know, a portion of his equity, but not all of it. And then sometimes people get bought out. So okay, the company's worth 10 million, you own, in this case, 10% of it, you got a million dollars in shares, okay, uh, we will give you $500,000 today. And uh, we will give you $500,000 $500, in the next uh, year when we raise our next round, or uh, we will give you interest on that. Uh, if we can't, but anyway, of the next funding round, if the funding round is uh, you'll get 25% of the next funding round up until $500,000. So if we only raise a million, you get 250, and then we'll give you the next one. So you can come up with something that doesn't kill the company. And there's a hard discussion, right? It's hard to not be wanted. There's also coaching, I would advise looking for a coach. A lot of times people bring their childhood, the trauma, how they felt. I remember one time, somebody just felt as a co founder, and they confided in me, you know, I just wasn't liked, I, I felt like I was left out as a kid, and I'm being left out again, you know, and uh, it was really sad. I got I got very choked up about it. Um, if, if I'm being honest, and uh, I said to the person, listen, you know, of all the people who left you out as a kid, you do realize you're the most successful and worth over $50 million right now. And they look at you and they're just absolutely in awe jealous and perplexed at how unbelievably wealthy and successful you are and you can go do whatever you want now think about all the things you could do for your family and your friends and for society with a 50 million dollar bag i literally had this conversation with somebody it's like you're and at the time i was like you're worth a lot more money than me kid like take the bag go buy your mom and dad a house go buy a ski house go buy a you know jet card have fun let's go and um yeah so you know it's it's, it's, it's not easy stuff uh, but the same is true for people who get divorced or your know, siblings who have rivalries and you know, they, they lose the ability to be friends, something really bad happened, you got to go to therapy, uh, or have a third party or a coach in those situations, uh, you know, therapy, probably with family therapy or siblings going to therapy individually and then together. Uh, luckily, I've never had this. My two brothers and I are super tight. We'd jump on a grenade for each other or buy each other grande lattes anytime. Your mileage may vary, but uh, try and work it out. Try and be good communicators. Division of labor can sometimes help. You know, hey, you're responsible for design and sales. I'm responsible for operations and fundraising. Sometimes clear division of labor can also help. Uh, and then holding each other accountable for hitting the notes. And you have to be rooting for each other. That's the other thing. I see this in marriages, friendships, um, business partnerships, people stop rooting for each other. And if you stop rooting for each other, and then you tip over into not rooting for each other, you got to get out of that re relationship, you got to reboot the relationship and do some relationship maintenance. So do the relationship maintenance and, you know, be rooting for each other again. It's critically important. Great question. What does Jason think of Seattle? Has he spent much time there? Versus other um, it's cold and it's damp. Cold and it's damp. That's what I think, of, you know, I mean, no basketball team, no bueno. I have considered Seattle, I like it, but um, I really like warm places, I think. And uh, increasingly, I want to live in hot places, and then ski in the winters. So I don't know, maybe I'm super privileged. But I will tell you, like last night, I was looking at houses in Tokyo. <laughs> I was like, Man, I would really love to live in Tokyo for a year. I also love Australia, I could see myself living in Australia for a year or two, I would like to live in another country at some point, you know, I, I, I got a you know, I got three daughters, so I have to, there's a lot of factors I have to take into account. But when I'm an empty nester, I'm sure my wife and I will try that, like live in Paris for a year, live in Tokyo for a year. I'd really like to try some other places. I, like Singapore is fascinating to me. Uh, I think there's like places that are really unique in the world. I, I've really enjoyed like living part time in Lake Tahoe during the winter and summer and it's really changed my like state of mind and really opened up the aperture. So as somebody who spent 30 years in New York and probably didn't leave for more than five or 10 days at a time, Max, I kind of got addicted to New York, but I, there's a lot of there's a big world out there. And yeah, you know, Seattle's your jam. It's fine. And a lot of smart people out there. Great place to start a company. I will say that because you have all these incredibly 
successful Microsoft and Amazon people just hanging out. And a lot of them have money and can be angel investors. So you can really start a great company there. And I think it's a pretty great lifestyle, if I'm being honest. All right, Adam asks me, I have been working as a web app security consultant. Oh, nice. For 2.5 years, because I wanted to get a skill set that was recession proof is now a bad time to jump f to a fang. When you say fang, people, of course, know that's like Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, uh, Google, you know, these kind of companies, uh, Alphabet, um, I think uh, they now call Google. So uh, it's now a good time to go to one of those big companies. Maybe uh, if you can get a job there, they're gonna, they're, they're always gonna be hiring security people. So the idea that like, the security people wouldn't be hired because of the freezes, probably not true. And they're probably going to reset all the RSUs, like the stock options are going to be cheaper, right? So you probably get in when the stocks are cheap. So we're at the bottom of cycle, I do think if you are thinking of a career change, and you're really good at what you do, and you're in the app space, man, startups and apps are like just a golden ticket. So either start your own company or co found a company with a bunch of other folks go to Techstars Y Combinator launch accelerator, maybe come to founder dot university, which I'm teaching starting November 14th founder.university, but make apps, I would, you know, work with somebody and, and just make apps. If you can do the security part, you can learn the other parts. Uh, don't go for max money, go for max fun, and max impact and max upside. If you are a developer, I think going for max fun, uh, max creativity, max challenge, right? And max upside, because you're, you're always going to get the 150, you know, base salary. So what more do you need to live? So get your 150 and then work on something that has the ability to go to 150 million valuation. I mean, why not? Why not have that optionality? If you go work for one of the fangs, I mean, yeah, do you care about your dry cleaning or free food? Trust me, those things wear off real quick. You know, once you have paying for your dry cleaning is like, who cares? You know, and, and getting free food, who cares? Like, for, what are you gonna be a Gavone? You're gonna go in there, and you're gonna just like have two lunches and, and stay an extra hour to get an extra dinner? Like, who cares? The free, you're, you're an adult, you don't need free food. I just have a little salad, you, ha you have an omelet in the morning, I am making myself a nice French omelet with a little creme fraiche on some chives, and it costs me like two bucks with, you know, organic eggs and great creme fraiche and you know, fresh scallions. Like, it, 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 food's not expensive. It's, it's a gimmick, this free food thing. So like the, the fangs, you'll go there. And uh, as my friend Elon called it, it's a bit of a honey trap, great developers go in, they don't do their best work. And five, 10 years of their great years, uh, I'm saying this, Elon didn't, but he, he called it a honey trap. Careful, you don't get stuck at one of those. Uh, as you saw, like in uh, the TV show Silicon Valley, it is a bit of a honey trap, great developers come in, do they actually do great work? Or do they just kind of rest and vest talk to people who work in those places? I think most of them four out of five will tell you, yeah, if you want to rest invest, you want to work two hours a day, three hours a day, great. I saw somebody on Twitter, a developer was applying for a job at a startup. And they said, Listen, my job at one of these great big, you know, uh, fine companies only takes five hours a week, can I keep that job and take the job at a startup? And they're like, No, that's unethical and possibly illegal. And you're breaking your agreements with them. And then that's just immoral to, and he's like yeah but they, they pay me i get it done in five hours they don't seem to mind it's like really maybe ask them if they mind <laughs> i'm working five hours a week it's, they might want to recapture the other 35 hours a week they're paying for all right great question you know i've been on a health kick recently and I don't know, one of my secret ingredients, of course, it's athletic greens with just one scoop of athletic greens, AG1 formula, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, probiotics, and more. It's going to help you start your day off right. It's so easy. Yeah, just do one scoop, a little bit of water, you know, maybe if you're into juice, whatever you're into. Athletic greens is going to make you feel better in so many different ways by supporting your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy recovery and focus. I think for energy and focus, and for me, that's the big win. And maybe even aging, right? Because huh, I'm getting up there. And it's going to cost you less than $3 a day cheaper than a cup of cold brew. God, the cold brew by me here in the Bay Area is like six bucks. It's crazy. So it's about half the price of a cup of cold brew here in the Bay. No need for a million different pills. I don't like taking all those pills, swallowing them every morning. Go Just one scoop. That's it. One scoop. Do it for yourself. Athletic Greens is going to do you right. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash twist. Once again, athleticgreens.com slash twist to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Uh, Jason, what are the benefits for a founder to take VC capital if they are successfully bootstrapping? VCs could bring uh, some knowledge and some validation to your startup. They could help you with running your company on the margins because they might have networks where they could help you find executives. If you're a first time founder, and you've got a bootstrap company, I'm going to make up a scenario, you've got $100,000 in profits. 
on 50,000 a month in revenue. So you're making 600,000, you're making a 600,000 a year, you profit 100,000. A VC might come in and say, Hey, can you triple it year over year for three years? Uh, what would that take? And you say, Well, we need two more sales executives. And uh, we'd probably have to increase our product velocity, we're going to need another two developers. They say, Okay, two plus two, four, four, four people paid 150 year total comp, uh, you know, 75 base for the sales person 75 in commissions, two developers 150 K Oh, you're gonna get them offshore 100 K whatever, you need 500 extra K a year, I'll give you 1.5 million. You can add those four people over the next three years paid for I'm paying for the whole thing. Plus, you got an extra 100,000 years on marketing experiments to run. And you're like, Okay, yeah, I can definitely triple I can get from 600 to 1.8. And I can go from 1.8, I think to, you know, five or six, and I can keep the margin at 15 20%, or I can just reinvest that money. And so that would be the reason to take their money. Do you think you could accelerate the growth? And do you want to? And if you don't want to, uh, and you don't want that expertise, then don't take the money, you want to own 100% of your business, and that 1.5, you might have to sell 20% of the business to get that 1.5 million, you know, or 15% of the business. So you have then you're saying, Okay, do I want this jet fuel? Do I want this person who knows how to scale businesses on my board? Or am I going to find this annoying? And if I go down that route? Well, it doesn't end. So you're it's not like you can be like, I'm going to take that 1.5. I'm going to triple the business. And then I'm gonna say, you know what, now I'm going to go into slow growth mode. I'm going to triple get to 2 million. Uh, and then I'll lay off a couple of people and I'll have 500,000 in profits, 750,000 in profits, and I'll distribute, let's say you got to a million profits, I'll distribute 150k to that VC, and I'll take the other 850k for myself, give a bonus to my team, and call it a day. Once you get on the VC train, people are going to expect you to keep going, which means then you have to do uh, a series A after you if that was the seed round have to do a series A. So once you get on that fast track, kind of hard to get off the fast track, you'd have to buy out the VC, you'd have to piss them off, uh, be contentious, cantankerous, especially if things were going well. And we've actually had this happen. I had one founder, you know, God bless them. It's just like the business got to a couple of million dollars. And they were like, we'll buy your shares back. And I'm like, but this has grown. And, you know, like, it just puts a, puts us in a weird position, because now we've got you down in our books, in our audit as like one of our breakout companies, and you just kind of want to grow it 10 20% a year. What are we doing here? And it's like, well, it's making a profit, I can sweep money off the table. I don't want to go fast. I don't want to risk it. So that does happen. And so I just told them like, we'll just sit on an investment. I, I have a feeling even if you grow 20% a year, this will be a profitable investment for us. So we'll be patient. And so I like to be patient capital in that situation. Other VCs might not take that approach, they might demand you pay them back. Um, and pay you back at a valuation that you may not have the cash to do. So you just have to be careful if you I don't want to say it's like, you know, taking money from the mafia kind of situation where, you know, they want you to pay them back like 10% a month or 5% a week, you know, that's like the vig if you were a gambler, you might be asked to pay, you know, you, you, you're down $10,000. They might tell you, you know, to keep that 10,000 on the books, I want 500 a week, and you still owe the 10 K and that's growing by 5%. So it's going to keep going up. Uh, and the juice is going to be 5% a week, the vig, vigorous, um, if you've heard those terms. So it's not quite as sharky as that. And you're still in control of your company, but just creates an awkward position. You know, you said you want to go fast. And now you want to go slow. So just if you're gonna go fast, you go fast, you made that commitment. That's basically for the life of the company to unwind it can be hard. Uh, because then if it does go well, the VC might say, Can I have uh, you tripled the you tripled the business and you 10 x the profitability? Okay, I want 10 times my money back. I put in 1.5. I want 15. You're like, I don't have 15. I have a million coming off the business every year. I'd have to give you a million a year for 15 years. And they're like, No, I want 15 million right now. You know, it's that's the awkwardness that can happen. So be thoughtful about it. Um, and there are other ways for you to um, make money. And, and there are other ways for you to raise money, you could if you had a profitable business, go to one of the factoring companies and sell your receivables and, you know, for a 15% uh, interest rate, like a credit card interest rate, they might give you a $250,000 loan or a $100,000 loan every you know, 60 days for you to kind of build and get a little bit of your money in advance. So just keep in mind that this is expensive capital and be thoughtful about it. There's nothing wrong with wanting to own your whole business launch and this being a startup, I own 100% of it. Um, I could raise venture capital for a tomorrow, but I want to be in control of my destiny. And I don't want to have to go to some board meeting where somebody's saying, Hey, you didn't grow this fast, grow faster. I don't want to do unnatural acts. I just want to make great investments in companies and be thoughtful about how I build this investment firm and things like the syndicate. Does it mean at some point I, I won't spin off the syndicate and make it its own platform like AngelList? I could have thought about it. People have discussed it with me. But I kind of like the way it's going right now. I like owning it. Um, I like not having to have any interference and uh, not have to deal with investors. So be thoughtful. Friedberg did say that he loved there will be blood. 
uh, on the show. It's a great film. The performances in it are extraordinary. Um, and it shows a period of time in America uh, where anybody could just go west uh, and make their way in the world. It's a pretty extraordinary story of resiliency and man's desire to be successful. And I'm using the term men specifically here as a gender uh, or men of that ilk to be successful in a way that is unhealthy. And I think that demon that you see in the, the lead character, his need to win uh, is so acute, it is so intense that he's miserable. And he makes everybody around him miserable and he suffers. And so this is why it's very important as an individual for you to think about your own success and exactly how much pain and suffering you want to go through. Spoiler alert, like opening scene is the guy breaks his leg and, you know, but finds uh, a mine and finds like a big find and but like drags himself <laughs> uh, with a broken leg to, to cash in on it. And so it's a it's a it's a incredible film just aesthetically performance script, everything, uh, dialogue, storytelling, directorial, you know, prowess, everything is just extraordinary about the film. But I think that's why it appeals to folks because exploring that darker side, um, I think for men specifically, and watching like a man ruin his life to hit like certain notes or just lead a horrible, brutal life and have no joy. I uh, you do see that sometimes in business where people are not actually enjoying themselves. What's the point? You know, we live in a very advanced society now. There's plenty of ways to make money. You're not going to die of starvation in America, at least. Uh, there's plenty of food. There's plenty of jobs available here. We still have 10 million jobs available, even in this trough of the recession and stock market correction. So nobody in America is not going to have a job or food on their table. So that kind of like Maslow's hierarchy baseline is there. In fact, you could go work at Amazon and get 20, 25 bucks an hour and health benefits. Starbucks is an incredible deal. Uber, DoorDash, people are making 25, 35, 45 bucks an hour. I mean, all these opportunities are there. So one has to wonder, like, do you need to in your life be so cutthroat that you ruin your own life? Uh, you, you make yourself miserable for checking off some success or some numbers. I think mo I have seen people who get very successful never... Uh, reach happiness or any kind of enlightenment. And so that's where purpose comes in. And I think, you know, probably why people like to see those stories is they like to think that they have that energy, right? They want to have that energy that I'll win at all costs. I'll drink your milkshake. I'm so combative. I'm so tough. The truth is you don't need to be. You could actually have a lot of fun and joy and be successful. That's one of the things I've learned. You know, like I tried to be successful for a long time probably put myself under too much pressure trying to be successful, probably too intense, probably work too hard. Um, and now I look at it and I'm like, you know what? I want to ski every day. I want to made it 40 days of skiing last year. This year, I want to see if I can have 41. I want to see if I can ski not only at Lake Tahoe, I'd like to see if I could see Hokkaido or maybe go to the Alps or France or something. And uh, to me, that'll be as successful this year as any investment I make. If I can go skiing with my daughters 10, 20 days and get out there on my own and maybe see another country. To me, that's going to be as equal success for me as uh, whatever I accomplish in business. But that's me at 51. I just, you know, I know I got so many years on the slopes left. I want to make the best of them before I'm gone. So be thoughtful about those decisions you make in your life. Don't forget to stop and smell the roses and enjoy the journey. And in that movie, he does not enjoy the journey. Is there an age cutoff that you'd invest in? How old was the oldest founder you've invested in? Great question. I don't want to ask people's ages. So I don't actually know the specific oldest age, I would think uh, we get pitched regularly by people in their 30s and 40s. And so we've definitely invested in countless people up to 50, like just off the top of my head, right? And, and in over 50, I don't know that we see many pitches from people over 50. If I'm being totally honest, I think a lot of people who get to 50, maybe they don't want to start businesses, or in some cases, they can raise the money themselves. So I don't see a lot of 50 year old starting businesses. So just in terms of the pipeline, I'd say the sweet spot of the pipeline and the, the statistics and the metrics do show this as well is that founders between 30 and 50 have, uh, especially if they're serial founders, have enough experience scar tissue to weather and not make some, you know, silly mistakes. 
what are the silly mistakes getting distracted, not talking to your customers, not building a great team, not building a great product, getting in legal trouble, whatever it is, not having enough cash in the bank, not knowing how to fundraise, not knowing how to do marketing or PR, not knowing growth techniques. So there is a series of mistakes that people make as first time founders, uh, or just as young people, inexperienced people put it put age aside, and let's use just the term experience. Uh, because age could be triggering for people, you could have somebody who worked, you know, in IT their whole life, and they're 40 years old, and they've never run a business. So they have no experience, you could have somebody who's 25, and they're on their fourth business, and they've sold to right that does exist in the world. So I mean, look at Palmer Lucky, I mean, I think he's under 30, and he's on his second billion dollar company. So you have, you know, the experience of having built a company, it really actually helps what people will say quietly, behind closed doors, to not get themselves in trouble, is does this person have the energy or the desire? Do they have that fire to be successful if they were 50 or 60 years old? Um, I think that's a valid question for an individual to ask themselves, certainly like, okay, I'm 50. My kids are 10 years old or 15 years old or 20 years old. And I've already got money in the bank. Like, why am I doing this? I've only got 10 years left. I've only got 20 years left on the plan. And if you're six years old, I actually don't think that way. I think like any number of years you want to do it. I'm here for the pitch. Let's go. But I do think people would have to ask themselves that right? You would have to ask yourselves. Okay, if you were starting a business at 60, let's say, do I have the desire, the chutzpah, the energy to work five, six days a week, or am I going to sit there working on this going, hey, I'm going to be dead in 10, 20, 30 years, or less, and you never know when you're going to go. Do I want to spend my last 20, 20 years? This, or do I want to go on vacation? Do I want to ski 50 years, 50 days this year, right? You're, so being thoughtful, again, wow, this part's coming up a lot these days, think it through, make sure that you yourself as a person who's up there in years, actually have the fire desire to do it. Uh, and if you don't, then pick something you want to enjoy doing, you know, go work on a nonprofit, uh, be an advisor to a company, maybe you're not in the captain seat, maybe you're in the second seat. I think that I've seen a lot too, where people are like, you know what, I want to start this company with a team that maybe has more energy, more passion, desire, time than I do, time on the planet, you know, time every day to put towards this. And I'll be the executive chairman, what's an executive chairman, a chairman, uh, or chairperson, somebody on the board. Okay, they get together monthly, quarterly, whatever with the team and help them set the direction. An executive chairman might be somebody who comes to the office two days a week, maybe they're there Monday and Tuesdays working with the team, they take over some specific functions, and they they do actually some work at the company. So give it some thought. I don't personally have any limitations on this. I have a 70 year old came to me with the next best idea and had a killer product, I would be like, Yeah, you're 70. Great. I mean, you, I guess, practically speaking, you might want to have a secession plan in place if you get up there in age, I don't know when they start talking about succession planning for executives at public companies. But I would, I would think in somewhere in their 60s, because the average man lives 72 or 74 years in the United States, I think is the number. So you'd probably want to start thinking about that somewhere around 10 years before then. So probably at 62, 64 is when succession planning as a topic comes up. Uh, and certainly in venture, you didn't ask this, but in venture, people start thinking of rotating people out by the time they're uh, hitting 60. So you saw Doug Leone, Michael Moritz, Bill Gurley, a lot of people who were in their 50s, or maybe I don't know, even in their even 60, um, maybe weren't in the latest fund or were transitioning out, right? Because I think a lot of people think that VC, venture capital, the ability to invest is a, a young person's game. And then you have some people like Alan Patrikoff, who is, you know, way up there, I think is in his 80s, one of the early uh, New York venture capitalists, Alan Patrikoff, I understand somebody told me is sharp as a uh, sharp as a tack, and he's still investing and still super engaged. And that'll be me, you'll be sitting here watching me. Uh, and I'll be 87 years old doing this week in startups talking about some AI robot, you know, downloading some consciousness into my system and talking about the iPhone 96 when it comes out. One fact that you need to know about startups, finding engineers is super time consuming, and super expensive. It's the biggest pain in the neck in startups, I would say raising money is easier than finding great developers. Well, if you're looking for qualified international developers without the crazy time differences, or if you just want to scale without sacrificing on quality, well, Ravello is the answer. Ravello is a talent platform that matches you and your startup 
with vetted full-time remote developers in Latin America. They work in the same time zone as you in the United States. Plus, it's more cost effective than hiring in the US, obviously. And you'll get matched with vetted candidates within three days. This lets you hire internationally so quickly and so easily. Revelo's engineers are, of course, full time and they're embedded in your team, just like normal employees. They're proficient in all the things that you probably have in your stack, whether it's AWS, Rust, Ruby, React, Python, Node.js, and more. Revelo's customers, wait for it. GitHub, Foursquare, Carta, Indiegogo, Kickstarter. I mean, this is a who's who of successful companies. So go to revelo.com slash twist and mention twist to get 20% off your first three months. Plus they offer a 100% risk free 14 day trial period. If you're not satisfied, you pay nothing. So head to revelo.com slash twist and mention twist to get that 20% off. All right, everybody, welcome to Thursday. That means this week in streaming with our friend, Mr. Lon Harris. If you don't follow Lon on Twitter, amazing Twitter, you're gonna Thanks. get Lon interacting with a who's who of Hollywood <laughs> nobodies. Literally, yeah, not, not everybody you don't know who actually makes in Hollywood is interacting with Lon. I, it's I not the people. celebrities. It's not celebrity directors. A few, there are a few celebrities in there. Okay. I got All a right. couple celebrity followers. Tom Lennon from the state, big screenwriter. He follows oh, me. Oh, okay. Well, that's what I'm talking My exact point. You, w There are a bunch of screenplay writers, producers, people, people like that. But that's and, true. Uh, I do have a, I have a great, I have a great following among, yeah, there's a lot of hmm. like showrunners in there. Is that? And the yes. guy, uh, I just added the director of Lightyear. Do you see that? That Pixar film Lightyear. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was praising it and he and I started talking. So now I'm followed I by I understand uh, there's Angus. a little controversy with the Lightyear. I didn't see it. But Lightyear. That's the same one as that, you know, it's they, there is the acknowledgement. Yes. Well, that's the, the big one is yes. Now it's Chris Evans is voicing Lightyear instead of Tim Allen. But it makes sense because I don't know if you know the, the premise of Lightyear as a standalone film. Is yes. that in the nineties, Andy, yes. the kid from Toy Story, yes. went to go see this movie. This was got the it. big movie when he was a kid that sold kids on Buzz Lightyear. Yes. And then he got the boy. So got the it. voice in the movie wouldn't necessarily be the same actor that gets to voice the toy. I see. I see. But Tim Allen seemed a little upset about it. Well, that's a big that's a big payday. I mean, Tim Allen, like if you're thinking about if mm. you're Tim Allen. You know, your your number one iconic character, Tim the Toolman Taylor from Home Improvement, in my opinion. Yes. Okay. After that, Buzz Lightyear. I mean, that's, right. you know, it may be Galaxy Quest, although I'm now trying to think of his name from Galaxy Quest, and I'm struggling. Galaxy Captain Quest. Jason. Completely underrated uh, sci-fi comedy. Amazing. It works on multiple levels. It works because it's a heartfelt film. Right. And it's like it's really funny. doing a sci-fi adventure. It's not just a joke. It's not but space it's balls. Got that, right. But it's also got that level of Star Trek sort of parody over it. Yeah. And also, I think it was an early example of um it's it's a it's about it's about nerds and nerd culture, but it's not just making yes. fun of them the whole time. It's not just that get a no. life, you dorks. It has real respect for and love for the nerds yes. who love the yes. show. And that that was like very forward. Like back in the nineties, that was not cool. You yeah, made you beat fun up nerds of nerds back then. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so were... I think it was an early indication that the, the culture was sort of shifting in the nerds favor. Just hilarious. Um, who's the guy who played like the Spock character with the headdress and everything? Oh, that's uh, Alan, Alan Rickman. Rickman. The great Alan, Alan, Rickman. Alan Rickman of uh, Die Hard fame. I think Alan Rickman, this is like one of his great performances because he plays like a true thespian. Right, like a Shakespearean who, stage actor. Who now lives with the curse <laughs> of being known as this character and being beloved as it when he just wants to be known as Macbeth or right. whatever. But then he kind of comes full circle when he realizes like there is something to this pop culture icon that he created that he can embrace. It's, and right, and the, the, it's beloved by he's having the impact he always wanted to have on people, even though right. the material is sillier than he than he thought. Okay, so speaking of being typecast, <laughs> I watched the first episode 
and change uh, started the second one and had to stop watching the Jeffrey Dahmer story. Oh, yes. Monster Dahmer, the Jeffrey Dahmer story or whatever. This is an incredible performance. I don't know who is playing Jeffrey Dahmer in it. Evan Peters is that guy's name. He's I mean, been in he's in a lot of the Ryan Murphy stuff. He was in American Horror Story. Uh, uh you know, he's been in a few other Ryan Murphy sort of projects. He's also uh Quicksilver in the Fox X-Men movie. Where the guy runs guy runs real fast. Oh, he's like amazing the when he with the goggles who with the yes, silver hair. He, I didn't yeah. realize that now I real now I've put the connection together because I couldn't put together yeah. who he was. Nor did Quick I want to type in a Jeffrey. Division. Remember they had that cameo in WandaVision yes. where it's like, oh, isn't that her brother Quick from... Silver yeah. is an underrated character from the underrated X-Men series of the uh, first class. Right. When Those they, the, the, they throw right, back. The Fox, re yeah, the, the remakes. I and, yeah. love the first class movies. Uh, I just watched all of them. There's, I think, three or four of them in that genre. I want to say four. Because, right. yeah. There's first four. Because they had the Phoenix. Days of Future Past, Past uh, Apocalypse, Clips, and then Dark uh, Phoenix. The Dark Phoenix. I watched them with my daughters. They all love it. They love it. And that character, now I see it, plays Jeffrey Dahmer in this incredibly right. disturbing portrayal. Yeah. The first episode is, I don't want, you know, it feels so realistic that to make the comparison to the, the you know, most famous serial killer of uh, cinema, Clarice. Oh, Hannibal Lecter. Have the lambs stop crying. <laughs> yeah. Who is this man, you see? You look back on that, and as terrorizing as that was, it seems overplayed now. Whereas this one, I don't know how you feel about this performance, but it seems so realistic and disturbing. I almost felt like I was watching a doc. Yeah, you I'm, not a big, I'm not a huge fan. I, I listen, and I get, I get that there's a lot of back and forth about true crime. Some people mm -hmm. feel very strongly negative about it. I, I, yes. I get that it has its place and that some people are very fascinated by these stories. I don't think that's like, I don't think there's anything like morally wrong with it, but it okay. does make me, it does make me feel uncomfortable and creepy. And I don't really like that, that feeling that I'm getting entertainment out of just Correct. Crime and depravity with this show in particular, because there's so much focus on the victims and like mm. they're recreating, you know, the victims in court and they're having actors like reenact there, there is a lot of like, are we re traumatizing these people like the people who survived there? They lost loved ones to Jeffrey Dahmer. Many of them are still alive. This wasn't that long ago. So we could file this under too soon, perhaps. Yeah, it's um, like I don't, I don't yeah. know. They're, they're, yeah, it's they're uh, uh, just like people are saying uh, in the comments. I'm saying like when it's real people, it's recent history. It's this brutal, unthinkable stuff that happened to them. Turning it right away into a TV show does feel a little. It feels a little mm. off. It feels a little crass to me. Feels like you're perhaps capitalizing on just the most tremendous suffering and pain you could ever right. imagine i understand their argument completely and i also understand the argument of art and people being able to create things in the art world but this all comes together through the lens of massive distribution so in another time period this might have been a boutique independent film seen by but well, you know, are, there's a bunch of Jeffrey of Dahmer. People. There's yes. my friend Dahmer, and there's one just called yeah. Dahmer with Jeremy Renner playing yes. Jeffrey Dahmer. There, there's, but we've, I think that's the other part of it is that that's we've what I'm saying. done, we've done this. We, 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 yes. there, it's not like there's no Jeffrey Dahmer content out there. In fact, Netflix has another, you know, they have that conversations with a killer series. Yes. Yes. They have one of those coming out about Jeffrey Dahmer soon as well. And obviously it's synergistic for them. It's a tie in. But mm. how much Dahmer content do we do we really need? I mean, it, it, is this Ryan Murphy saying too that he's focusing on you know the victims and the police and why didn't they catch? It's not just reveling in the crimes. It's like right. digging into the case file. And I, I, I guess there's some value there too. For most of us learning a second language in school, it was a joke. I remember like three words. Probably learned nothing from that Spanish or French or Italian class you took. Well, that's a thing of the past. There's a better solution now. It's called Babbel. Babbel is a learning app that's sold over 10 million subscriptions. And instead of using AI, and instead of using AI, their lessons were created by over 150 language experts. So we're talking the best people in the world. Right now, producer Nick is learning Italian, hey, eh? So he can talk to his Italian side of the family in their native language. He says he loves Babbel's quick hit 10 minute lessons. 
great way to learn a new language efficiently. Babbel offers 14 different languages. Spanish, French, Italian, German. Plus, Babbel's speech recognition technology helps improve your pronunciation and your accent. In addition to the lessons, you can also access podcasts, games, videos, stories, and even live classes, right? It's a 360 approach here. And if you need one more proof point, a study done by Yale showed that 100% of Babbel users improved their oral proficiency in just three months. Right now, you can save. 55% off your subscription at babble.com slash twist. That's babble.com slash twist for up to 55% off your subscription. Babble, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L. Babble, language for life. There is a massive breakout success here in terms of consumption. So I think that is what the story is here. Right. Is it's if this had flown like under it. the radar with, you know, a million viewers, we wouldn't be having this conversation. This crossed over into pop culture, correct? Yeah, this is a huge hit for Netflix. Uh, their second biggest hit of the year after Stranger Things season four, it's starting okay. to look like uh, a, a, a sort of an all timer in terms of English language. These like probably going to be in the top five or 10 English language wow. seasons of TV they've ever released. And the other big thing is this is the first big hit from their mega deal with Ryan Murphy, the guy who came in. Right. He's done. Uh, glee and he had that screen queens an american horror story an american crime story they made this 300 million dollar mega ah. deal it was one of those initial huge platform deals, deals. We, we have you exclusively for whatever right. you make exactly and shonda rhimes was another one of these that netflix hmm. made that, that led to like bridgerton you know the scandal producer yes. who came over and now made inventing anna and bridgerton so it's and Murphy's been making content for Netflix. He did Ratchet, that Nurse Ratchet Cuckoo's Nest oh, yeah. prequel show. He did Hollywood, this one about a, it was sort of like a an, a fanciful reimagining of Hollywood history, like what if Hollywood had been diverse going all the way back to the 30s and 40s. Hmm. Uh, he did a show called Halston with Ewan McGregor about the fashion designer. He's done a few other things. Nothing has really hit so far. Got but it. And this, this is why one, people were questioning the platform deals are these things yes. going to pay off were these things done in the peak market in fact it came up on the all in podcast the other week where david Sachs was saying you know hit the back channel here in hollywood was that they weren't doing any more deals and that these platform deals were a sign of like the peak netflix stock price right but this thing has over 300 million hours viewed in its first week of availability I so mean, people yeah, are you clearly binging it i don't know how many unique users that is if it's a 10-hour series or it's a five or 10-hour series i'm guessing yeah they, so it, it's, uh, I believe it's I believe it's eight eight episodes, maybe ten episodes. All right, so eight if, episodes. I think. If everybody watched four hours, you're talking about a hundred million people, seventy five million people. Is that possible? I mean, fifty I, million like, people. Like, How many people have you watched it globally? I mean, worldwide, there's a big audience for e English mm. language. You know, English language content is one of those that, that yeah. sort of transcends a lot of the market geographical boundaries you know we're seeing yes. korean shows have a lot of breakouts spanish language shows have a lot of break Squid game yeah Squid game obviously number one but also extraordinary yeah. attorney woo from korea was a huge hit this summer oh. so like we're seeing that now that squid game kind of broke the seal or, or opened the barrier international audiences are coming to more korean shows and and korea is having a sort of a big international moment right now uh yeah. And Spanish, obviously, because there's so many Spanish language countries. Spain is a huge powerhouse for churning out content, but English language content goes really well. So, yeah, I mean, I, I do think it's reasonable that a very mm. high profile show about a very famous individual from a big creator, because Netflix mm. also has a lot of power. I mean, if they put it all over the front page in every market, it's going to get a lot of clicks that, that they can I create tell you what's these phenomenon mm. sometimes. Now, this show does not lend itself to advertisers, of course. Now, there might be some advertisers who'd be okay with it. Sure. There would be some who say, like, absolutely not, right? You're not going to, like, get a McDonald's commercial in the middle of a Jeffrey Dahmer show. Right, yeah. It's, it's but a you could get, you know, some other TV show or, like, you know, might want to. Uh, I mean, there's certainly disturbing FX shows or what have you that sure. still get sponsors and ads, sure. Sure. So, Netflix is going to launch their advertising based things so these number of hours based on this kind of content we could see these number of hours jump dramatically when they have their it's, it's not going to be a free tier it's going to be a discounted tier no, right? like it's, a lower bucks, cost, it's a lower cost seven, yeah, eight like bucks. disney's is going to be 7.99 with okay. ads and then 10.99 for no ads so that's be the same thing here i'm guessing it'll be roughly or, i would say roughly. netflix will probably be roughly in line if Netflix had a free tier 
with only a selection of shows and only shows that were, let's say, 90 days old. Right, like what Peacock does. Yeah, what is the, what would the viewership of this be in 90 days? Oh my lord. I don't know if they want to do that because they would train people to not pay for it and just wait it out, but my lord. Oof. I wonder if they did, like, you get the first three episodes of every show and then you have to pay. How brutal would that be on consumers you could watch the first three I, jeffrey Dahmer's yeah. first three stranger things and then it upsells you on paying that was you... what my my mom has that on peacock and she gets uh, so frustrated i almost feel like just based on anecdotally based on hearing her complain i feel like it's not a good strategy you don't want to you don't want to tease people like, it's like yeah i i i, I don't i think you want to deliver sometimes you want to give people a positive mm. feeling about your service and if you're constantly yeah cutting them off after they've seen two episodes of a new thing they like that's not a great experience you know what they should do is they should do like a netflix week where netflix is open for five right. days that's just to get I everybody think. to download the app well i mean i think we're, we've stumbled into one of the biggest problems that these services have which is how do you have both a paywall but let people know you've got great stuff behind the paywall without yeah. giving it all away i mean it's the showtime problem in a nutshell that they can't really figure out how to use Paramount Plus to get more people to sign up for Showtime. So they're just going to end up having to basically give them Showtime. Like there's, it's not, yeah. they're trying now to like, oh, give us an extra five bucks a month and we'll give you all the nope. Showtime shows. But One if you price. can't watch Yellow Jackets, you don't know you want to see Yellow Jackets. If you watch the first few, you'd it's get that you want to see it. But otherwise, yeah. it's just like another name of a show you've never seen. Yeah. I mean, Apple it, too. It's the same thing. Like, I yeah. can tell you Severance is great, but it doesn't sell you like putting it on TV would. Mm. Netflix has spent $500 million, I think, on Shonda Rhimes, Ryan Murphy, and Kenya Barris. Yeah. Well, and Kenya, that, the Kenya Barris deal is already over. It's over, yeah. He's jumped um, over to, I believe, BET he went to now. Oh, okay. He's creating his own in house studio over there now. Oddly, Trevor Noah. Uh, and by the way, Netflix's earnings is coming uh, out on October 18th. I may need to make yeah. a J trade there. Uh, and, we'll see. I mean, it's, we'll it's, see. It's, we're in fascinating times with all this now. Every, I feel like every quarter where it's like a wait and see, like who's doing what, that it's really coming down to the wire on a lot of these. Well, yeah, I think that is a sign that there's a lot at stake here. When you see this yeah. kind of hand wringing, when you see this kind of investment, when you see this kind of dogged competition and pricing tweaks, it means there's a lot at stake. And so when there's a lot at stake, then it's because it's probably a very big prize at the end. And people are fighting it out for, you know, what will yeah. be I as I uh, have said many times, I think somebody, I think two people will have 1 billion subscribers. I think the consolidation has only begun. And I think Netflix and Disney are my top Netflix, Disney and WBD, Warner Brothers Discovery, those are my yeah. top three candidates to hit a billion. And I think you could see consolidation, you know, from here, uh, going yeah. forward. All right, network TV is dying. That's the other oh, big yeah. note here. I, I <laughs> yeah, it's 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 winding up. It's the big, yeah, the I big mean, one is Peacock this week that the NBC Universal announcement. What happened there? Uh, Jeff Shell, the president of NBC Universal, uh, he basically there have been rumors and the trade stuff floating around. NBC affiliates are going to get back the ten to eleven p.m. time slot what? on the Hill Street Blue all. slot. The same the elsewhere Blue slot. Yeah. So uh, NBC is going to basically stop making shows for some nights from what? 10 to 11 and return those hours to local, you know, your local NBC station will get that hour back to do with whatever they want. Uh, it is a, you know, obviously for, for Shell's explanation, it's a cost saving maneuver. They're going to produce less original content. They're going to worry about filling, you know, three or four less hours a week with shows, but it's another obvious indication that, NBC's not where it's at anymore for debuting new content, and that's not where people are watching it. And it's wow. just, you know, it, it's worth it to save the money and effort for them rather than this is make bonkers. New Why wouldn't they have a deal? Like, if you were NBC Universal has the Peacock streamer, but I guess can you imagine if Hulu or Netflix had access to that time slot and they just well, I mean, ran? I think this is what we're like. They're, they they may. I mean, like if it, if it goes back, if, imagine your you know Bay Area NBC station. Oh right, you do a deal with Hulu and say we're going to put Dope Sick on. 
They wow. could do whatever they want with that 10 to 11 slot. They could license content and air it from 10 to 11 on I NBC. never understood this like local affiliates thing. I guess they wanted the local affiliates. I guess it w had something to do with the FTC and how they gave I mean, out these it, licenses. It, it, it literally yeah. made said this system was designed in like the 50s. <laughs> so this had to do gotta, with like ensuring the public good was it, it was public airwaves was yes. what they were worried about and thinking about. And that was it. There was no, there wasn't cable underground. There wasn't satellite TV. This was it. This was there your wasn't TV internet. service streaming right. yeah so, so this is like a vestige i wonder what happens to these assets it reminds me of radio stations like who's yes. using radio there's still people using radio but i remember i spoke 10 years ago at a podcasting conference called rain and i said listen here's what you do if you're a radio station you, you forget about the fact that you own time slots whatever you are just a content creator you make shows you have to make shows that are so good that people will seek them out and you have to publish them as podcasts independently with advertising on them and put them on air. And when they're on air, you tell people to download the podcasting. Uh, and you go rank in the podcasting apps. And you have both. You have people who don't know how to use their phone or podcast catchers at the time was podcast catchers. I said, and you mm -hmm. know, you have them here and then go find other people who want that show and license it to them for their local market. As long as they say, you know, you can download the podcast if you missed episodes. And eventually you you know, you basically get both. That's what should be happening here. NBC should be saying like, just get Peacock to get this whole library and they should be putting reruns on or whatever, but I guess yeah, it's, it's so, I mean, that is functionally what they're going to do. Yeah. They're just yeah. farming that work out to the local stations instead of NBC corporate figuring out what to air nationwide during 10 to 11. This is just competition. You know, like when you have a, when you have this dogged of a, co a, a competition, yeah, the streamers have, and I see this in startups, Lon, if you have to convince people to take their wallet out and pay for something, my Lord, you are focused on getting uh the content to a really memorable place you know so it spreads by word of mouth right. as your point was with severance you know or any other show uh you really have to get people talking about because it it's not like they turn on their tv and you have the default distribution of you know whatever the four channels that people get over the air right and that is um you know the beginning and end of this uh, they have been out hustled with better better content and their content just doesn't keep up with what's I mean, look, uh, I think Peacock actually, I think Peacock has some really good shows. I think Peacock, I think Peacock's biggest single issue is just being so late to the game and not having, they don't have their breakout. They don't have their must see. They don't have like yeah. their rings of power. There isn't that P like the office. I think they were kind of counting on the office being that draw. We bring you in with office reruns and then we show you girls five Eva or mm. Rutherford falls or one no. of these other good originals. I don't know if they've got compelling enough originals to bring people in, but ha as a Peacock subscriber, I, I watch stuff on Peacock. I don't feel like I'm underusing yeah. my Peacock. Just feels like they're they're going into a you know gunfight with a knife. They're they're they going in. Real, yeah, yeah, they have a real like second class status that I don't know how you drop at this point. I think they need to do some real big moves to get out of that Paramount Plus ghetto of being. Yeah. Not the top tier, you know, they're not seen as one of the top tier essential services. Well, this is this also led to us having a discussion offline. Um, on text, you and I were talking about how some of these folks had great content, but they let it slip away. Oh, yeah. Well, Comedy Central, we were talking about that. Yeah. Uh, Explain that. Comedy Central had built up, you know, over many, many years, this like huge library of mm. comedians and shows and like, cool. You know, they were, they had like, if you thought of what a Comedy Central show was, you would form that. It had a brand. It had a voice. We, it was like kind of indie, alternative, skewed a little younger, but not like that adult swim stoner comedy, like smart 30 something mm. com, you know, like that. They had a, they had a little like place in the firmament. And if you think mm. of Key and Peel, Inside Amy Schumer, South Park, like that era, you really knew what Comedy mm. Central was. I mean, originally and they were Chappelle Show, correct? Chappelle Show, right? Exactly. And uh, and 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 I think that what we've seen is a lot of those Comedy Central. They, they stopped making original live action Comedy mm. Central shows. I think Corporate was was one of the last ones. Workaholics that er, that late era. Got uh, it. A lot of those shows got farmed out to HBO Max as opposed mm. to Paramount Plus, which is owned by the same parent company as Comedy Central. So now, if you go on Paramount Plus, there's a Comedy Central hub. It's got some old stand up on it. They've got the Key and Peel reruns, but it doesn't. It doesn't feel like 
a hub, a, a vital place to go for new comedy right. the way that it should, considering the South prominence Park of on, Comedy Central. Is South Park available on HBO Max and HBO on Max. Paramount Plus? I think or only the most recent season. The most is recent stuff is on. I don't know. There's some the, the Paramount Plus. It's very has confusing stuff. as a South Park fan. Well, to where do I find it? The big the big compromise they made was the the South Park Library lives on HBO Max, but mm -hmm. they're making those original specials. You know, like Got once it. every month, there's like a South Park: The Streaming Wars, a special yes. movie. That's how they're they're supplying new content. To totally Paramount confusing. Plus too. So it's yeah. it's kind of they're doing both. Super confusing. I don't yeah, like it. It's not. It's not uh, great. And it's just. And I mean that, especially South Park at this point. That's the number one Comedy Central brand identifier. Like you gotta now, lock that down. That's like the them show, losing Yellowstone. It's like it's well, like their anchor. Yeah, yeah. It's like them losing Hell Street Blues. What, uh, what, yeah. What's the story with Hacks? Now Hacks, I very much enjoyed. This right. was a great created, show. They're the team behind Broad City. The the Hacks team. Uh, so they created Broad City at Comedy Central, and they were this in-house Comedy Central mm -hmm. team, and then Comedy Central let them go. They were like, we're not doing live action got scripted it. anymore. They went and got a deal at HBO Max, very first show to emerge from their no deal, X, Emmy winning. Emmy winning. The woman, who, 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 both of them Gene won Smart. or one of them? I think Gene Smart. The older one yeah. that plays the older Smart, comedian, Gene right. Smart one. Yeah, mm. Deborah, Deborah Vance. <laughs> she plays Deborah she Vance. She plays Deborah show. Vance, who is like, I, I guess a Joan Rivers type. Yeah, exactly. Did now, you know the, that uh, Hannah Einbinder, the young Ava, the younger yeah. comedian, is Lorraine Newman's daughter from Saturday Night Live? I did not know that. Original she, SNL cast member Lorraine Newman. That's her daughter. That's amazing. She is uh, quite charming in that role. Uh, it's quite uncomfortable. And it's, <laughs> uh, dare I say, like delightful to see a female-driven uh, uh, comedy show because there's been this you know women aren't funny meme uh in comedy you know oh women aren't funny blah 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 i, I find the show hilarious uh so i don't yeah you know. that, that's that's an example of you know they had that team that 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 was hmm. a comedy central creative team that could have been making shows for paramount plus Crazy. right now hmm. but now they're off doing hbo max instead it's wild yeah yeah now Peacock and NBC Universal Streamings has 15 yeah. million paid subs. Right. That was the other announcement that Shell made the other day. Got Jeff it. Shell. Uh, 30 million if you include their free ads. Right. Because they've got, they've got a Not free bad. version. It's Not fine. I mean, look, the, the Peacock free service is actually pretty good for movies. It works a lot mm. like a 2B or that kind of thing. They've got a lot of movies up there for free mm. that you could just stream if you're willing to watch three or four commercials. I saw somebody tweet that they had to watch seven commercials like in a row to that's, watch something on lot. streaming. And I was that's like, really? I don't usually that find it that cumbersome, but I'm also not a huge I'm not a huge fan of that. Like I, I kind of streaming is sort of trained me mm. off of watching a lot of ads and it, it does kind of irk me, especially in a movie. A TV show, okay, that's one thing. But when they randomly cut into the movie as you're watching it, that's enough. Uh, we'll talk about Andor and House of the Dragon next week when Molly's back. Sure. Um, I had to take a week off from watching them because my wife went away for a couple of days and she wanted yeah, to watch them with me. So now I'm, uh, you know, I'm in that. I'm like, I got to watch it for work, but I got to wait. So I figure we'll wait for Molly. We'll do we a two for next up. week. We can we can do the catch up. It makes sense to do a, to wait a few weeks because they're really they're in groups of three. The the, the episodes. The episodes oh. are meant to be watched in three episode arcs. And what? so we're in the middle of an arc now anyway. D you Did, remember how they, they disclosed that? I remember they released the first yeah. three. I agree with you. It well, was one. I, I think they, they've sort of said it's, it's a, it's some mini arcs within this full season, but uh -huh. when you watch it now, it's pretty obvious that yeah, each story unfolds over three episodes. So you mm. watch one per week. You're kind of seeing a third, a third of the story. I did like, uh, we didn't talk about it yet, but I did like the intrigue of going to, you know, the inner workings of the information bureau, basically. Oh, of I love it. The I empire. And they're yeah. just like, a, it was sort of like the Stasi in uh, the lives of others, where yeah. they're like each trying to, you know, be responsible for a different group of people that they're tracking and trying to figure stuff out. And yeah, they're and then it's very like cutthroat. Like they're all they're cut all cutthroat about know. nothing, right? I I, uh, like I I love that Tony Gilroy, who created this show, he also wrote and directed the film Michael Clayton, and uh -huh, I love yep. the like he's doing it again. It is kind of about the like 
conflicted morality of being a a, a cog in this vast corporate machine and yes. like what it feels like to be you know try to like make your own decisions but you're just one part of this like huge bureaucratic organization and i i love that that, that there's that commonality that's not a, at all what you expect from a star wars show it looks so good aesthetically that no i good. watched the fight between obi-wan and uh, darth vader again yeah which i loved at the time and i just it was stunning how much better this show looks to that one I, and i, I was would, like i, I feel like show, i got ripped off they should have had the obi-wan fight on a real set I like that show. The, the I liked Kenobi. I still enjoy it, but yeah, there there are some real limitations to that 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 green screen box that they don't sell you on right away. They're they're saying, "Oh, we could transport our characters anywhere," but it's very stagey and claustrophobic, and it does limit their movements a lot. And Andor, they're just in the woods. They can put the camera anywhere and shoot anywhere they want. That would have uh, been a better look than this I crazy, agree. like, rocky, smoky planet that they had this incredible lightsaber duel on. Like, yeah. that should have been done on a proper set. I, I think I agree they were with rushing to the finish line. Like it's just me being an old older guy, and I like stuff that nope. looks like the stuff I remember. But I no. agree with you. Like, I nope. don't really it like this nothing to do with their age. It's just aesthetically clear one is better looking than the other. I just, I can, I n I'm now at the point where I can tell, like a, 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 I can, a, a scene starts and I'm like, oh, they're in the, they're in the green screen box. <laughs> like yes, I, I so know obvious. that my eyes can detect, even though I don't know how exactly that they're not in a real place. Hmm. What are you most looking forward to, uh, in terms of the end of the year movies oh, and wow. shows? What are you most looking forward wow. to? I know that black panther is coming is yeah, black really panther excited is coming? For, really excited for wakanda forever that looks wakanda. great I, I mean this this spielberg one the fablemans gotta gotta be looking forward to that anytime steve doing something deeply you heard about this it's, it's basically no. it's autobiographical it's about a kid growing up in the 60s loves movies making his huh. own movies while his parents are going through this very sort of traumatic divorce and so huh. it's sort of Spielberg doing like a Roma, like telling his own story. Michelle Williams already what getting a ton. The Fablemans. Uh, Paul Dano is his dad. Michelle Williams is his mom. Seth Rogen is his uncle. Uh, wow. Already getting, it's got a lot of Oscar buzz, already getting a lot of, of excitement out there. I, I can't, I can't wait to see that one. That's this it. looks incredible. Wow. Yeah. So it's based, you know, it's very interesting. They said during the, uh, during Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, right. which was a very dark film, <laughs> Galima, uh, and uh, they said, uh, was it Spielberg going through a divorce at that time or Lucas? Um, I think that was Lucas. Spielberg fell in love with Kate Capshaw on the set. Capshaw on the film. Anyway, they said that like the the people who are making the film went through some like very dark times, and sure, yeah. that's why the film is so like bitter and cruel. Like you have children yeah. being whipped in the film. Oh yeah, no, it's a mean movie. That movie. It's a sadistic mean movie, right? People yeah. are being burned alive. I, or, I, I mean, love it, but it it upset it upsets a lot of people. <laughs> well, the, it, e eating monkey brains like there's a yeah. so many well, things. Also, I mean, there's there's that's a separate issue. There is a little bit of like Orientalism, a little. It's a little racist yeah. as well with the, the on the margins, Indian people and their culture. Yes. And, and yes. Uh, there's that. There's that. I'm not defending that. That's a separate issue. But I do. I really like the the darkness, and I do feel like it's kind of a nod to like a lot of those '30s things they're riffing on. Were kind of dark too, with the pulling hearts out of people's chests, and yeah, it's a yeah, little it's, weird. It's and hard gross. when you do an homage to a genre, and the genre has some, you know, um, yeah. yeah. Here it is. Uh, I'm also coming to life the since the circumstance. Go ahead. Oh. Oh, I was going to say, I, I'm just reading here. Both Lucas and Spielberg have expressed regret of how dark they allowed Indiana yeah, Jones and the Temple they've of Doom to get. <laughs> after, after they had kids, <laughs> they came out and were like, I don't know why we did this. Kids loved Indiana Jones and we made it really gross. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they've. Well, that also PG, that led to the PG 13 rating, that movie. Was that, that the was, one? That was, well, it wasn't the first PG 13 movie, but it was one of the movies that came out that was so violent. They didn't know what to do with it, and it sort of inspired them to rethink the the race. That's right. It stuff. begot the PG thirteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Uh, wow, this is amazing. Like these little moments in time um, that these things happened. Right, because uh, you know that that it's like kids loved Raiders and in this character, so they want to go see the new Indiana Jones movie. But then it's like, yeah, they're like cannibals. <laughs> it's like this crazy 
cult. They're drinking blood and Nuts. possessing people. And yeah. Both of crocodiles. them were in dark places. Lucas was going through a divorce at the time. Yeah, the filming right. was being put together and Spielberg himself had seen a long-term relationship of his own fall apart. Interesting. Lucas Ford Spielberg had become fathers not long before embarking on Indiana Jones and the last crusade. Uh, those weren't the only reasons right. for the harsh the film. Crusade Lucas was trying to very, follow a path. Yeah. Right. Last Crusade is this very like, like more family focused and funnier and yeah. lighter. Like they very obviously cut very the joyful. other way. That one. Yeah, yeah, maybe a little too much. Lucas yeah. was trying to follow the path he'd successfully followed with the Empire Strike Back. The Empire right. Strikes Back. But both have admitted it didn't help. Wow, that's really great. I, I wasn't I this it. is Spiel this is Spielberg. I wasn't <laughs> happy with the second film at all. It was too dark, too subterranean, and much too horrific. I thought it out poltered poltergeist. There is not an ounce of my own personal feeling in Temple of Doom uh wow i i disagree with him on that one i'm still a big fan but yeah well, I, I, mean, I was gonna say oh sorry go ahead i was gonna say with the there was just a picture at the disney thing or something of the, the um the the actor who played short round in it yes uh, well he's in uh, everything everywhere all at once k yes. Hui Kwan. yes and so there's a picture of him with that that trended on social him, right, and, with him uh, and harrison together harrison, I, I guess that stuff. was the first time they'd seen each other since the film they said which is very I mean, weird maybe. when you think about that. You have this like well, iconic he retired. thing. The, the short round, he, yeah. he hasn't been in films all along. He took a, a long time off and now is sort of back. Yeah. Have you I seen that Everything actually. Everywhere All at Once? Yeah, you I like did. Um, I, I was one of the films I watched in my new movie theater, which I have to have you come to talk oh, so we can do a little yeah. movie festival. Yeah. Um, I'm going to upgrade the, uh, I've got like an eight year old projector. It's, it's totally serviceable, but I've been like looking at these laser ones that do these great yeah. darks. I've got a killer sound system, but I'm looking to, I need, if anybody has ideas of like, what's the best for a small theater, it's like a, you know, it's not a huge theater, but a home theater. Uh, not, it's yeah. a home. It's, it's a theater though. <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> cool. Uh, it's mind blowing for me. Uh, I'm obsessed with this thing. It's 12 seats, I think. Two rows of six. Wow, that's not bad. That's it's, but these room, are luxury yeah. seats. You put your feet up, you know. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. They're big, delightful chairs. Anyway, it's very nice. Um, but I'm going to get the, I'm going to upgrade the old thing. But it's, it's kind of nice to think about what movie you're going to watch, plan it out. The kids love it. We have a popcorn. I got one of those like uh, actual theater, movie theater popcorn machines. Yeah. You can buy it on Amazon for a hundred well, bucks. Make it more of an event. People pay more attention and you get Correct. more out of it. That's what yes, that's what we yes. do. I think that's a big thing with people when they're talking about the theatrical experience. Everybody always thinks it's about sound, it's about the big the size mm. of the screen. You gotta see it on the big the IMAX screen with the sound. And that that's that's part of it. I'm not saying that's not a thing, but part of it is mm. also you're in a room with nothing else to do. The lights go down, you're yes. you're sort of primed to watch and, and take in take what it you're all seeing in. instead of being you know, distracted by a million things in your living room. And I think a home yeah. theater gets that uh, 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 as well. You plan it out. The lights go down. You're in this comfy seat. It feels like being in a theater. And so your brain focuses on what you're yes. watching more. And so I enjoyed the film. Um, I thought it was very uh, surreal and interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. It wasn't like my favorite film of all time, if I'm being honest, but I'm glad no, they made it. No, it's not my what favorite of all time. I, 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 I feel pretty similar. I, I thought it was a lot of fun. I thought it was very creatively made and Correct. shot and like exciting from like, you didn't know what was going to happen next and where it was going to go. And it was very inventive. And I really enjoyed that. And I thought Michelle Yeoh was, uh, was fantastic in it. A great role for her. Always Oversold been a fan. maybe? Because I hey. people seem to be freaked out that this was a life changing film. It was far from it for me. Well, she doesn't get, she gets a lot of like, the old lady who's going to teach you how to do kung fu like she plays the same uh, kind of parts in a lot and i think that part of the she's such a great actress and if you watch right. chinese films and asian films she plays all kinds of roles and i think that it was nice to see her get to spread her wings a little bit so there, there's got part it. of it that it's just finally she got a part where she's not just a tough old lady who knows how to do judo and is going to uh, kick your ass she's got a real emotional arc in this movie she gets to really play a character so got people it. have been fans fans since the super cop era now i get it's it. fun yeah now now i totally get it this makes a lot more sense to me why people lost their mind over it because i i i i, I recognize her but i have not seen a ton I mean, of films a with Hong her in Kong it Kong action fan she's been which killing not, it since yeah. the 90s like she's yeah. been all over the place you know crouching tiger was was 20 say, years i ago. remember her now from crouching tiger hidden dragon which was like very unique and amazing and eye-opening at the time but well, she's you know, 
they're swinging and through let's the face trees. It, like it's you know, I, I, I found uh those you know, like that's like a very narrow genre that, you know, I find is a little yeah, repetitive like to me. I like I like a lot of the martial arts stuff. I like I was them. Also I'm a say martial the, artist. I like them, but I, it's to right, me, it's like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was also going to say, uh, later this year, the one other one that I'm really stoked for is Knives Out 2. Glass Onion. Uh, you know, Knives I didn't Out. watch the first one. I have to finish it. I watched Out. the first 10 minutes and then I got distracted and then I was going to, again, watch it with my wife. And it's then my, terrific. It's really fun. I, I like, people I love like it. those Now that's the actor who, uh, Rain Johnson. Ryan Johnson, that's Ryan the writer Johnson, director, director, writer director, director yes. of Last Jedi, yeah. Uh, who, yes, who got <laughs> destroyed from Last Jedi. I always see people like making that comparison. Well, this one film is extraordinary and that this film is terrible. It's I very like uh, maybe polarizing. It's a little polarizing. I got to watch it. I got to watch it. Okay, so they're doing a sequel. They did a sequel. Uh, they did. It was, I played it. They played at Toronto last month. Uh, it's coming in December. Mm. Uh, all new cast, all new mystery. Oh. But it's just Daniel Craig. So... It's oh, the next okay, my Benoit style icon. Blanc. My style icon. Right. He's doing it's like an Agatha Christie. Like he's gonna move between the movies, but every movie is a new investigation. So this one is they're in the Greek. It's Ed Norton is a billionaire, tech billionaire. He's oh. having a party on his yacht. Uh -huh. And then there's a murder, and Benoit Blanc is there and he's gonna solve the, the case. I love it. I love it. Modern day Columbo. Yeah, yeah Columbo exactly, exactly. meets James Bond exactly what it is yeah yeah i like it i like it. i gotta get in on this and that's lon everybody twitter.com slash lons l-o-n-s on twitter follow him there inside.com slash streaming every day he talks about the streaming world I do. see you next time i'm gonna lon. get back bye to bye. Right now.